Welcome back to The Urban Monk. Dr. Patrick Shojai here with uh, one of the best experts I know. Guy has got a pure heart and an amazing brain. His name is Tom Maltair and he is certified integrative medicine practitioner. He's been teaching a lot of the smartest people I know about the research that's out about functional medicine. The deal with this show is that we really started to peel back on where these chemicals and toxins are affecting us in our body. We're talking about endocrine disruption, we're talking about how we're getting smothered by plastic, and all kinds of stuff that you got to know about. Uh, enjoy this interview with Tom Maltair. It's an important piece. You need to listen to this and you need to have your family listen to this. It makes a very big difference because the exposure is where you can stop the insanity. Your face is all over Origins. Uh, loved, you were like the sleeper hit. You came in and really kind of brought some of the most substantial data to that party. And uh, it was it was really kind of eye-opening for a lot of people, President Company included. As I'm interviewing you, I'm like, holy crap, really? <laughs> right? Do you remember that? Uh, we slotted like, what, a half an hour or something for me to sit down and then hours later, you're like, tell me more. And yeah, then, yeah. And I stayed an extra day and we, we have tons of conversations, yeah, yeah. It's just ugly and you don't want to see it, right? Like, it's just so big. Like, when I hear 74 billion pounds of chemicals, I, I, like, what the fuck is that? You know what I mean? Like, a billion pounds of chemicals. Where does, like, I, I can't even fit that in my mind, so, like, the number is just so huge mm. that it's kind of like the old Stalin <clears throat> quote, right? Like. If you hear about one family getting killed, it's a tragedy, but if you hear about 100,000, it's a statistic. That's exactly right. And, and you know, there's no way we can comprehend that. And it's not just 74 billion pounds, it's 74 billion pounds of chemicals per day imported or produced in the United States. That's data from 2010. We know that a lot of those chemicals have increased in sales exponentially since then. So it's like, wow, where are we at? That number didn't even include pesticides, pharmaceuticals, fuels, food additives some of the biggest classes of chemicals. So you say to yourself, like, what does that mean? What does that mean? And basically what it means is we are saturating our air, our water, our soil with chemicals. And these things cannot help but getting into the wildlife. They cannot help getting into our food supply. They cannot help getting into us. Mm -hmm. So we've had these awareness calls, right? We've had the Environmental Working Group and whatnot in a group up in Canada looking at the cord blood of unborn children. And we're seeing hundreds of these chemicals before they're even born. We're seeing the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2010 launching this study that basically says, guys, what are we doing? Developmental kids' processes, developing the brain, developing your organ systems, developing what's going to be your immune system. All that is a very finite process in utero. And anytime you interject a foreign substance into that process, you run the risk of altering the outcome. And what we're seeing is that's exactly what's happening. You know, a lot of these chemicals are these endocrine disrupting chemicals. Okay, you hear this all the time, the EDCs is what they're called, mm -hmm. right? And these endocrine disrupting chemicals are really fascinating because at minute levels, they act as hormones. In fact, they're called xenoestrogens commonly because many of them have very potent estrogen binding capacities, meaning instead of your own estrogen in your body working to signal growth and change and normal processes, you will have a foreign substance like a paraben, for example. In fact, I have a quote in one of my, my presentations that says the estrogenic power of parabens in our children is now stronger than their own estrogen. So our external exposure to one class of chemicals is now enough. But gosh, you know what's happening, Pedram? We've had in the year 2012 alone, right, a drastic rise in use of something called bisphenol A or BPA, right? And you know, I mind to try and look for data, I look for numbers, right? It's over 745 million pounds was bragged on an industry site, was introduced into the global supply in the year 2012 alone. So they were saying, guys, this is awesome, right? Scoreboard, <laughs> we win. <laughs> <laughs> you should invest in BPA, 745 million pounds in one year. That's outstanding. And look, let's project that we're gonna have a lot more than that, right? So you start looking at this and you start realizing 
that there's now 16 billion pounds of this stuff being used globally, right? By the year 2025, they're projecting that you're gonna have just this massive saturation of this chemical. But guess what, man? In 1891 is when this stuff was originally synthesized, right, in a laboratory. And by the 1930s, you know what its primary use was? It was a synthetic estrogen used to fatten up animals. <laughs> now everyone's on a weight loss program. Okay. <clears throat> yep. So wait a second. If we're s spreading billions of pounds of this stuff, we can test samples of air and find BPA. We can test samples of water and find BPA. We can test samples of breast milk and find BPA. You can pee in a cup right now, I'm gonna find BPA. Mm -hmm. So at small minute levels is how BPA acts. And we can see shifts in hormone function and shifts in obesity. So it's, it's fascinating to me now that you look at these charts, they'll start back in 1990 and they'll jump to 2000 and 2010, and you'll see these CDC charts of obesity in the United States. And originally we were like 10 to 14% obesity back in 1990. Now you'll see the vast majority of the United States, especially in, in places where there's a high population of Hispanic and, and African American people, the actual obesity is closer to 35% in a couple of decades. So everybody's like, you know, oh, it's the sugar consumption, it's the high mm -hmm. fructose corn syrup. Yes, that's part of the story. Mm -hmm. But behind the scenes, look what's happening with our industrial chemical supply. It's burgeoning, it's exploding. You're seeing pesticide use, just track glyphosate, for example, the most common herbicide now used in the United States. Back in 1992, the consumption was, was pretty darn low. You know, we're, we're heading up now. We're up to 250 million plus pounds being applied every single year. So we went down from you know, tens of millions to the 250s of millions in a couple of decades. And if you look at some of the Pearson correlation coefficients, so some people have looked at the data and they said, is there any association between diabetes and obesity with pesticide use? And the correlation coefficients are 0 0.96, 0 0.98. They're pretty tight, meaning it's likely that we're dousing our planet with these chemicals. They're getting into humans and they're changing our physiology. So if you look at some of these plastic agents like phthalates, there's a Taiwanese study done on some kids. The higher the level of these phthalates in the urine, the lower their thyroid was. So you know how many people are, are dealing with thyroid issues and they're mm. getting replacement thyroid. Mm -hmm. You look at some of the studies on some of the, the BPA, the phthalates, especially phthalates from lotions and sunscreens, for example. Did you know you can apply a personal care product like a sunscreen or, or an anti-aging cream, right? And as you apply that, it goes through your keratinocytes, your skin cells, and gets absorbed into your system, right? It ends up in your blood supply, it can end up in your urine. They'll track the levels of these phthalates in the urine. So I'm gonna use a cream, and that cream is blue, and it smells lovely, it's wonderful, right? And in order to get that blue color, which is usually an oil base, and in order to get that fragrance, which is usually an oil base, into something that can spread on my skin and last a long time, I'm gonna put parabens, a preservative in it. I'm probably gonna put in phthalates to stabilize the combination of oil and water mixtures. That's what phthalates do so well. And boom, that gets sucked up into my, my system. We're seeing in men who use six personal care products a day, each personal care product they apply, 33% increase in phthalates in their urine. Ouch. Okay, check this out. Female study, Northern Mexico. They were applying personal care products to their bodies. And the more personal care products, the higher the level of some of these phthalates in the urine. What they noticed is in postmenopausal women, there is a two times increase of breast cancer the higher the levels of these phthalates in the urine. Mm. Now, in the women, it was something else. They saw over a four times increase of breast cancer as the levels of these things went up in the urine. So what are we saying? Well, What we're saying is the cancer cells are positive to estrogen signaling, we know that. That's why everybody's using tamoxifen and other things to try and cancel out the conversions, right? So you don't want excessive estrogen around, but we have it in our environment. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. So you start thinking about this and you're like, okay, well, <clears throat> where do I find these substances? Where do I find BPA? Where do I find phthalates? Fragrances are massive. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but can you walk through a grocery store anymore, down an aisle with a bunch of detergents and just 
calmly go or do you kind of rush through and go, oh, oh, or go through a hardware store and you smell the pesticides and all of a sudden more and more people are becoming sensitive to those smells. And that's usually saying that they've hit a threshold, right? They can't metabolize that stuff fast enough and the body is now overly sensitive to it, right? <laughs> I was just in New York on book tour yeah. and um, I was in some hotel. <clears throat> now every one of these damn hotels has their own signature smell in their lobby. And to me, it smells like cancer, right? It's just like... <laughs> it smells like it's cancer. It's disgusting. Yeah, so I'm sitting yeah. here like waiting for the car to pick me up. With I'm just getting agitated, thinking to myself, God, this this sucks. Yeah. I can't stay in here. I'm starting yeah. to get a headache. And you could tell when your body's not comfortable with yeah. some odor. So then I go outside, curbside waiting for the car, and there's these two guys smoking cigarettes, like kind of blowing it in my face. And I'm sitting here thinking, I, I'm not quite sure where to stand. It's like oh. it, it's like an intrusion. Mm. I didn't ask for this. This is this is offending my neurology, my physiology, mm. my hormones, mm. and everything. <clears throat> yeah. And you know, would, did that come with the 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 cost of the room? Yeah. Why? I didn't want that, right? And and so every single <clears throat> time I'm exposed to that, I think of the patients that I've had over the years that are laid up for two weeks when they're exposed to something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm slightly se chemically sensitive. Yeah. I know people that like are bed bedridden because of this stuff. And right. So it's big. Let's talk about that. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, as part of the Autism Research Institute Scientific Roundtable, and I got exposed to these immunotoxicologists that were just absolutely brilliant. And one of the people I was uh, put in a room with to discuss what's going on with children's brains was Claudia Miller. And Dr. Claudia Miller, uh, drclaudiamiller.com, has really looked a lot at, at a concept called toxicant-induced loss of tolerance. So mm -hmm. we have this immune system, right, which is misnamed. It should have been called the microbial interaction system, right? It's our sixth sense. We have all these divine cells that are constantly surveying the outside environment saying, is this friend, is this foe, what's out here, right? And they're expecting to interact with microbes every time they peek their little heads out, right? They actually snorkel, little dendritic cells. They actually put little things out into our intestinal tracts, mucosal lining of our lungs. They're searching for microbes all the time. They come in contact with microbes first, yes, but also since they're surveying the outside environment, they're the first to come in contact with environmental toxicants. Mm. So the toxicants talk to the microbes, kill the microbes, change their behavior. That can be problematic. And then the toxins talk to the immune cells. And the immune cells then shift their behavior now, one of the common things that people forget is the immune cells are not designed to attack constantly. That's not their job. The primary job of an immune cell is to be calm. The primary job is to have the immune cell exposed to most things and not respond. You don't want too much inflammation all the time. You don't want your body attacking itself. You want it to only attack certain agents, certain microbes specifically. Well, we're seeing that under the influence of chemical use, just like humans when they're under the influence, we don't always have the best judgment. Neither do our immune cells, or our microbial interaction cells. So they start overreacting to substances in the environment. So we're seeing now, if you look closely at the allergy research, we're seeing a lot of the allergies came at the turn of the century when we started using a lot more chemicals and had a lot more pollution. Mm -hmm. You start seeing, you know, it used to just be the hay fever, right? And now we've got ragweed and pollen and dust mite and peanut allergies and everything. This is new. The body was never designed to be allergenic. It was never designed to have asthma and eczema. It was not designed for that. It would interact with the microbes and go on with its merry way. Mm -hmm. But now what we're seeing is there's this miscommunication and the assumption is by some of these immunotoxicologists, and rightly so if you look at the data, is that our immune cells are under the influence of toxic chemicals. So Claudia gives these beautiful examples of how she'll go into a place where there's been a chemical spill or an accident or whatnot, and she'll watch how people develop food sensitivities overnight. They didn't have any food responses, and now they're allergic to foods, they're sensitive to foods, now they're sensitive to all these smells, all these things are happening. But she says, look, you can have a triggering event that causes this tilt, your toxicant-induced loss of tolerance, or you can have long-term, low-level exposures, and then you hit a threshold. Mm. So my imaginings, if I look at the research and I talk to these world expert researchers, is that we're all now hitting thresholds at a, a far greater amount. So when that postmenopausal woman comes into you and says, I can't 
inhale something. I was behind a diesel exhaust of a bus the other day, and now I have chronic fatigue for the next two weeks. Yeah. Threshold reached, passed, done. But you look at the data on the sense, and it's fascinating. 30.5% of the general population has a sensitivity to some sort of smell. 19% of those people is going to be air fresheners. A little over 10%, closer to 11%, are going to have specific responses to scented laundry products. Mm. Air fresheners, of course, you know of like the plugins. It gives all these commercials for these spritzer spray things, you know, all the time. Scented candles is the norm these days, right? You walk into a cab in New York City, they've got something hanging from that rearview mirror, of course. You're going to get dizzy from that, some people. And we see if you put people in a clean room and you look at their pulse response, you look at their symptomology, it's real. People get brain fog, people get fatigue, they get watery eyes, they get, you know, challenged breathing. All sorts of different things occur. This is not a adverse phenomenon that's unknown to the human population. 30 plus percent of the population now has this response. Because it's suffocating and it's everywhere and we've hit that threshold mm -hmm. and then the question is, is there any coming back? Like, if you're at that place where you're, you're at the threshold, one would assume you want to mitigate exposure, which is kind of the obvious, you know, stopgap yeah. on everything. Yeah, yeah. And then, how do we start getting this stuff out of our systems? Okay, first off, we, we have to limit exposure, yeah. right? Not just for us, but for the planet, man. I mean, you Amen. start talking about the billions of pounds that are coming in the United States every single day of all of these different chemicals. Right? And you start isolating plastics, and you start seeing that we're dealing with you know, 12 plus metric million tons of plastics ending up in the ocean every year. Okay? 12 plus million metric tons of plastic in the ocean mm -hmm. every year. Projected 2025 that we're going to have over 31 billion pounds of plastics being dumped in the ocean every year. What does that mean for the fish? What does that mean okay, for yeah. life? So you see per square mile, we have 46,000 uh, you know, pieces of plastic that you're gonna find if you do searching on the surface of the ocean. You're gonna see that when you look at the life in the ocean, there's plastic everywhere. So over 90% of seabirds have plastics in them. I don't, have you seen the video Midway? It's yeah. on Vimeo, Midway? Yeah. Oh my God. So you have the albatross population in this island off of Hawaii, and this man comes with his camera and he films these albatross, and after they're being born or early in their life cycle, they're dying right in front of him. Mm -hmm. And he's like, what in the world's happening with these albatross? So while they're still warm, he makes sure they're completely dead, but while they're still warm, he'll perform autopsies on camera, and he'll pull open the stomachs of these albatross, and you will see bottle caps, and you'll see old lighters, and you'll see pieces of plastic, like, it's, it's amazing that they could have survived as long as they did. Yeah. But what's happening with the sea life is these birds are coming down and they're trying to grab fish. And in the process, they see something sparkly that looks like a fish, but it's a piece of plastic, right? You know what's one of the worst things is the sea turtles. Now, we're seeing between 84 and 86% of the sea turtles are having ingestion of plastic to a point of causing toxicity for them. They see plastic bags as jellyfish. Mm. So they're ingesting these jellyfish, right? And it's killing them. Hmm. The reality is the average family is using about 1,500 plastic bags a year. Wow. So quickly, easily, what we did in Bellingham, Washington, we banned plastic bags. So everybody's like, well, how do you do that at the grocery store? I'm like, come on, are you kidding me? We have these handmade, handwoven African baskets that we bring, okay, that were sustainable. And then we also have these organic canvas bags and we take them to the grocery store. We have them in the back of my car, my wife's van, you know, all the time. We just have these bags with us all the time. Mm -hmm. It's second nature. Yeah. First couple of weeks, I was like, oh my, what's this? You know, it's a pain in the butt. And now it's just like, you know, this is what we do, right? Right. We bring in our, our glass jars and we want to fill up spices, right? We're bringing in, I have a glass jug that I fill up water with. I don't use a plastic jug to put in my, you know, a dispenser, I have a glass jug for that. It's an Italian one, it's very nice, heavy, right? But it builds up the biceps and I love it. It's like CrossFit every time yeah. I get water. Right? Might as well, yeah. yeah. right? So, you know, you find a way to get away from the plastics. The reality, if you start looking at this, the average human generates 4.4 pounds of trash a day. 4.4 pounds of trash a day. Western, Westerner, Westerner, we'll assume, right? Yep. Yeah. So what you can do is, and Lauren Singer, she did a really nice TED talk, a little 23-year-old gal, super sharp, right? 
she was like having enough. She was in class one day realizing that everybody around her was eating out of plastic and she said, this is ridiculous. Where does this stuff go? It doesn't biodegrade ever. It ends up in the global supply somewhere. We got to do something about this. So this, this gal took it upon herself to not generate any plastic. So she eats whole foods, right? She makes sure that she doesn't buy anything that's in a plastic container. And she managed to get now out of three years, the entirety of the plastics that she's generated or the entirety of the waste that she's generated can fit into a mason jar. Great. Three years, right? Great. So it can be done. There are some awesome companies out there, lifewithoutplastics.com. They have these amazing, I, I have one right over in the next room. They have these amazing stainless steel containers that you can store your food in so you don't have to use plastic, right? It's got a little silicone seal on the outside. It clips closed. Airplanes, camping, the office, whatever you want. You can heat them up. You can do whatever you want with them. They're going to last for a very, very long time. You don't have to use plastic over and over again. Check this one right. out, right? Here's a neat stat. They wanted to find out where the highest sources of BPA and, and uh, phthalates were going to be in people's lives. And so they followed people around and they, they watched what they were eating. And of course, you've got saran wrap and you have your meats wrapped in, in plastic. And then you've got the canned goods, right? We know that BPA lines cans, right? All cans, pretty much? No, not all cans. There's a few companies that are using a, a vegetable-based resin. Actually, Eden Organic Foods was one of the first. And their beans and their non-acidic foods, they can line the cans with this vegetable resin. It's completely safe. It's great. A lot of the BPA-free cans, though, mm -mm. The research is showing that you still get endocrine-disrupting chemical activity from BPA plastics. So it's mm. not necessarily a solution. So let's go back. People who are consuming regular diets from heated Tupperware containers and plastic bottles that they were drinking from, poly polycarbonates like Nalgene and whatnot, you know, all they had to do was eat something called a fresh food diet. Get rid of all cans, get rid of all plastic bottles, drink your milk and your orange juice from glass bottles. They can reduce their BPA by 66% by eating a fresh food diet. Great. I don't know of a single Bushman who used to store stuff in plastic. How could they? Right. Yeah. There was salting, possibly, that could have gone on. There was a smoking that could have gone on, right? We now have refrigeration. We have these different ways of getting around that. So I'm going to invite people to get really creative and say, look, come on. You can't have something dumped into the ocean, billions and billions of pounds. You can't have metric, millions of metric tons of stuff dumped into the ocean without a consciousness. And the reality is, what you see in the news about the Pacific gyre patches, uh, Science Magazine just came out with a beautiful review on this, is about 5% of what's actually in the ocean. So if you see 5%, and that's astronomically horrific, I mean, you see these images of people swimming through plastic, and you know, it's just, it's out there. What's going on on the ocean floor? Because mm. they're now showing that this stuff sinks and settles. And people are wondering, you know, why is it that we're seeing oar fish coming to the surface that are normally, you know, in the extreme depths and whatnot? And my imaginings is the behavior of the animals, the behavior of the ocean itself, behavior of the reefs, everything is changing because of our chemical influences, right? So that's one aspect of it, the plastics. Fresh food diet seems to be amazing. Watching what you're putting on your skin, anything that has a fragrance to it, watch what you're inhaling. The dryer sheets, they, they've associated asthma with a lot of these scented items. And asthma is oftentimes associated with eczema, which is oftentimes associated with a loss of tolerance of your immune system. Mm -hmm. right? So we just have to start putting these pieces together. But oh, Go ahead. I was say, so all of this exposure, if you were to cut it and stop drinking out of plastic mm. and yeah. Stop using the, the creams and the potions and the lotions and the, mm -hmm. the Febreze and the air fresheners. That 66% reduction on the front end is obviously great for your cellular metabolism, but the other third of that that's in the air, in the water, in the oceans, that's still impacting you. So even if you think you're squeaky clean from yeah. what I'm hearing, yeah. what's happening to the oceans from other people's activity is still going to impact and affect you, mm -hmm. which means this is all of our problem all the time. Okay, there was an interesting story that was told to me by Dr. Michael Clapper. Okay, he's a, a heart doctor, vegan proponent in, in Hawaii. And I lived in Hawaii when I was a kid. And uh, 
Dr. Clapper tells a story about some kids driving up to a stop sign and throwing out a can, right? And Dr. Clapper runs up, grabs the can, and hands it back to the child, to the window, you know, teenager, and says, I'm sorry, you dropped this. And the kid says, no, I didn't. I threw it away. <laughs> and Dr. Clapper says, well, tell me, where is away? Right? So you start thinking about this, and the reality is we are consuming things unconsciously all the time. We don't even know where it comes from. We don't know if there was any sort of suffering that happened in the process, right? Was, you know, the, the blue dye from my shirt, you know, was that something that was ending up in a river supply somewhere? And some little kid is trying to get fish from that river, and is that kid then suffering from the chemicals from the blue dye from my shirt? No, well, this is organic cotton produced by Patagonia. They're conscious of where their dyes come from. So, you know, where's, where's this stuff coming from? Where's your food come from? What happened to process your food? I mean, you know, the Roundup, what is that? That's coming from genetically modified crops being introduced in 1996 that are Roundup resistant. Now we've been spraying so much of the Roundup, you know, so it's like, wow, if I change then and I'm using organic foods, if I'm using non-GMO foods, does that shift then what's happening in the water supply, in the air, in the human bodies, in infants that are developing in utero? Damn straight it does. Damn straight it does. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, this is the fascinating thing, Pedro, man. From the Origins movie, you know, I think the reason you were attracted to some of this thing is because I'm so excited to learn more about native culture, right? And in the native teachings that I was taught, there's something called these concentric rings of awareness. So native peoples, if you go to any culture anywhere, they're super happy. They're super connected with each other, the world around them. They want to know what's happening underneath their feet, in the soil, in the leaves, in the air, all the time. They're praising, observing, you know, how does this affect me? How am I affecting it? It's this level of awareness, right? What's going on? What is the barometric pressure in the air? What is the moisture going on right now? Can I sense if the wind's going to be changing? Do I know if that plant is a little sick? Can I give it a little bit of, of nourishment? Maybe I can maybe eat my fish and put the fish underneath the tree to give it some, you know, there's this consciousness of like, what is around me serves me. Therefore, I should serve what's around me. Mm. I'm getting my air. I'm getting my oxygen from these plants, mm -hmm. right? I'm getting my lifeblood, my food from these soil microbes. Why wouldn't I want to give back? It'll end up back in me, right? So what are we doing? What's going to end up happening based on what we're doing? So conscious consumerism, being aware, seems the way of getting us back to a place of health. And, and I would say more importantly than a place of health, a place of belonging. Yes. So anytime yes. a person really connects with where they come from and what's around them, <clears throat> they feel like they're part of something much bigger than themselves, right? So when I walk into a grocery store and I'm conscious of the fact that I'm not generating plastic waste, I sigh this huge sigh of relief when I look on the news and I see, you know, I saw this National Geographic video of a sea turtle and someone who was tagging a sea turtle, these marine biologists was tagging the sea turtle and they're about to throw it back in the ocean and they look and they're like, what is that in its nostril? And they say, oh my gosh, it looks like it's a big worm in the nostril, right? So they take these pliers and they start pulling on this, what looked like a worm substance. Uh, you know, the turtle's going, wah, 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 making noises, you know, and there's blood coming out of the, and you're like, oh no, ah, that looks terrible, right? As they keep pulling and pulling and pulling, and getting this thing out, finally it comes out all the way. It's a plastic straw. <laughs> so this turtle, as it's feeding in the ocean, right? it somehow ingests a plastic straw and tries to regurgitate it and it comes out through the nose and gets lodged there. Oh, yeah. So this turtle's existing with a plastic straw sticking through its nostril. Of course it can't do that very well. Right? You're welcome, yeah. Right? Yeah. Here's the thing, man. There are bamboo straws that rock. They're mm -hmm. gorgeous, they're super sturdy. Bamboo's totally sustainable. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of being conscious. It's like, wait a second, man, you know? This kid, the, the kid that Dr. Clapper went up to, this is the part that's amazing, is, you know, for me living in Los Angeles, California, um, I don't see where my trash goes. And, and I, could, I could basically rationalize away as being like, I don't know, maybe they take it out yeah, to the yeah. desert of Nevada and bury it with radioactive waste <laughs> yeah, and we'll yeah, never yeah, see yeah. it anyways, right? Shoot it out into space, But when man. you live on a frickin' island, I mean, it should be so 
clear mm. that there is no away, yeah. right? Yeah. Because there's nowhere to go. You're on an island. So that can of Coke now is also on that island forever. Yeah. yeah. And so that's the infectious meme. That's the consciousness that's permeating and letting this all happen. And so that's where we have to correct everything is our own behavior and the behavior of our children understanding that. So we're talking about home care items. We're talking about personal care items. We're talking about cosmetics. We're talking about plastic water bottles. Yeah. Where else can we mitigate exposure? Like how can we be on the right side of this equation and not add any more to this nonsense? I, I think actually, your movie, Origins, was beautiful. I mean, I Thank love you. the idea of getting back in touch with nature. So you going to a survival camp, you going on that safari, I think people have to immerse themselves in the idea that before this synthetic environment that we've invented for ourselves, we existed, we survived, <laughs> we thrived on nothing but nature. We did just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, for example, my friend runs this eco-village in St. Croix, right? And he was a student of an Apache elder taught tracker, right? Tom Brown, okay? Yep. And he basically teaches people, he says, look, let's get you in an environment where you see that you don't need this stuff. You have a lifeline of convenience right now that you think is saving you. Mm. You think it's delivering you from suffering. But I wanna show you something that when you can get out into the woods, you can pound this bamboo and make the floor of your own house and make a frame of your house and put on the palm fronds and you know you find out that you can build your own house within hours, right? And then you can go out in the ocean after making your, carving your own spear and spear a lionfish and bring it back in. They're invasive, so it's a good thing to get rid of them anyway. And you can trap a mongoose, right, and bring it back. And then you can actually gather your coconuts and you can gather some papaya or starfruit or mango, whatever is in season at that time. And you can survive, thrive, while having zero impact on the big picture. The plants will grow back. There are more fish in the ocean, right? You're not polluting, you're not grabbing one fish and destroying the entire environment by dropping your nets in there and having a humpback whale come in and get it. You know, it's just, the reality is, you don't have to suffer and you need very little. Hmm. And the more connected you can get with everything comes from Earth, the more you realize she's giving you everything you need and more, then the more you realize you don't need all this stuff. You know, so many people are searching for something. And I'll tell you what, I was this way, right? It's like, when can I buy something else? Hmm. You know? Oh man, I can't wait to get a new car. Oh my gosh, we need a new house. Oh my gosh, you know, that new computer's coming out here pretty soon. Or, oh my gosh, that clothes, I, you know, I really need that outfit. I saw it in the window and it's just like, it's gonna change my life. It's gonna bring me <laughs> happiness. They're all gonna right? love me. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna love me because mm -hmm. I'll look at me and say I'm a different person now because mm -hmm. I just consumed, I purchased, I have some sort of power. And this is ingrained in us in television. It's ingrained in us from the time we're born, really, in this capitalistic society. Purchase, 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 consume, 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 build the economy, right? Yep, be the consumer. Yep. I love how we're consumers. We're not even people anymore, we're consumers. That's right, that's right. So if we are succeeding as a nation, it's because we've had a great Christmas sales season. Yeah. We've increased our production and consumption, you know? And so I say, well, that's awesome if that's how life worked, right? Mm. But you've always got to get back to the true currencies of life, the true things that bring you your own consciousness, which is your ability to breathe in air, your ability to drink water, your ability to eat food, and to love other people. You know, without mm. that last component of feeling like you belong. Mm. And I have to tell you, when I went on a survival camp, a couple of days into the survival camp, I realized what an impact I was having on the planet in a negative way. Yeah. Because I realized I didn't need half of the stuff, three quarters of the 99% of the stuff I was consuming. And I started crying out of grief. I was just like, oh my gosh, I've been so separated from the planet, from the earth, right? I don't need all this stuff. And from that point, all of a sudden, I felt this swelling of respect, and I felt this sense of belonging, where I didn't need anything. I didn't need mm. anything. I just enjoyed being outside with the birds, looking for my food. It was awesome. You're a father of five children. Yeah, man. So having had that realization, having 
had that profound moment where you realize that you don't have to be part of the cancer that is growing across the planet. Literally. Literally. And the cancer that causes cancer, right? It's right. just, it's this, this system that's permeating and destroying yeah. Yeah. And, and disrupting our endocrine systems and all of it. How do you raise your children? That's a tough one. You, you do it through consciousness, right? So we have them in Waldorf education, mm -hmm. which asks them to be not exposed to media and the outside world. So they're asked to not watch movies. They're asked to not be exposed to stuff. We still let them occasionally watch things on computers, right? But we don't have a television in our household. And we're not playing radio. So the radio and the television, there's a lot of subliminal signals in there. If you see the consumerism, they're called commercials, consumerism promotion, right? It's happening all the time, mm -hmm. right? all the time. So without that, my kids don't want what other kids want. Right? If they spent time with some of their friends who are growing up in that other atmosphere, all of a sudden they need Pokemon cards. All of a sudden they want to wear certain types of clothes. Mm -hmm. Well, their schooling doesn't allow them to have brands on their clothes. They can't show a brand name on the clothes that they go to school. Great. So they'll have to turn a shirt out, in, you know, inside out if it has a brand name on it and whatnot. So the, the consciousness is focusing on the connection between the child and the outside world and the child with other children and the child with the teacher. Not with an idea outside of the classroom like the brand of Taylor Swift or the brand of certain clothing, right? So mm. they're trying to keep the, the children kind of in this naive state for as long as they possibly can, and it seems to work. Mm. You know, my kids now, uh, the other day, instead of, you know, I don't know what a normal child would do, my, my children were out playing in the trees. They were building a fort in the trees, hanging out, watching the bees. We have a beehive in my roof now. The bees <laughs> have made a hive through my old cedar shake, you know, and so they're watching the bees and hanging out in the garden. So I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a shift, right? And my, my boys went out with pine sap the other day and they took pieces of a tree and they stuck the sap onto the tree and they, they made little airplanes. So they took pieces of bark and laid it for the wings and they took the tree and they put the sap and, you know, and they were zooming around right. like that. It's like, man, they're getting that and what are they getting? They're getting fresh air. They're getting sunshine. They're getting physical activity. They're getting connection with the plants itself. They're getting the microbial cloud of the outside. We now know that humans have microbial clouds. Mm -hmm. Nature has microbial clouds. Anytime you walk into a room, there's a microbial cloud, right? So they're, they're bathing themselves in a whole entire process that's nurturing them on, on many different levels versus sitting in a sterile room inside air, right, which is more toxic than outside air now. Huffing paint, yeah. Huffing paint or volatile organic compounds, you know, from whether it's the cabinetry or the flooring, vinyl flooring or whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. vinyl, vinyl, check this one out. Plastics? There's actually an associative study of children who are born in houses that have vinyl flooring that have poor air circulation, so this condensation on the windows, they have an increased risk for autism. So the vinyl has phthalates in it, they can off-gas. You know what one of the biggest sources of some of this nasty chemical stuff is? Shower curtains. Yeah, the plastic ones, huh? Oh, vinyl shower curtains, man. Yeah. You know, they actually off-gas for six days thousands of times more than what you would want to have exposed to, right? So if you ever get anything vinyl, off-gas it outside for over a week, and yeah. then bring it back inside. But I, I highly recommend you just don't buy vinyl, yeah. right? This is a petroleum-based product, right? right? that produced a bunch of toxic gases, you know, in order to be made, and now it's in your, your house off-gassing. <laughs> it's, it's amazing because you think to yourself, but it's so cheap. I go to Target, it's 13. You go to the dollar store. You go to the dollar store, it's 13 bucks, you know. I'm going to save money on the front end, but yeah. then you're going to spend every penny you had on your breast cancer on, on the back end, right? And that's, that's, the pro that's the problem with our system is we then fall into the trap of the medical system, which doesn't really know what to do with cancer other than to nuke it, and it ends up killing us simultaneously, and it doesn't necessarily do too well for the cancer. So we have to have a different approach to cancer, and maybe it has to do with what we ingest through our skin, through our lungs, through our... Not maybe, absolutely. Right. I mean, if you look at all the compiled studies of pesticide data and everything else, there is no way that the chemical influences are not having. For every action, there's an equal or greater reaction, okay? It's just mm. one of the laws of life. Yeah. So you can't assume that because there's a small amount of something in nature that it's not gonna cause a problem. And you can't assume that you knew what's happening because you did a study in 2000 
and compare it to 2015 because we see an exponential rise of the production. We're going to see an exponential accumulation in humans of these compounds. Mm. And some of these things do not work on standard toxicity dosing. So normally when they look at chemical spectrum, this is what they do, is they'll do this LD50, like lethal dose, the 50% of the lethal dose, they'll figure out what that level is and say, well, you know, if you go exponentially lower than that, you should be fine. These small exposures don't kill rats, therefore they should be fine. They're not causing cancer in the rats in a 90-day trial, so they should be fine. But the rats are tired, they have headaches, they can't get erections, <laughs> and they're moody. <laughs> but they're not dead. Right? So uh, wait a second. The, you, you're not joking, man. Because I know I'm not. There's, there's actual studies showing that as levels of phthalates go up in women specifically, that they have zero, well, they have 2.45 uh, times decrease of sex drive. Mm. So there's this you know, announcement now that we have this female Viagra, mm. right? But no one's being conscious of the fact that chemicals in the environment are actually changing hormonal function, killing drive. Mm -hmm. And we all know that you know these things cause obesity, right? And a second name for endocrine disrupting chemicals is obesogens. Literally, this is how the scientists refer to them. Okay, mm -hmm. and we know there's actual trials now, gang. Like you just look at this and you see that the BMI goes up, and as the BMI goes up, multiple parameters from being aroused to being satisfied all go down. Mm -hmm. So there's this correlation out there that no one's looking at and saying, gosh, you know, maybe we have to. Maybe we have to get back to nature in order to get back to our natural vital drives. So, okay, we're running out of time and I need to know this. I think the moral of the story on the front end of this is don't be an asshole to your body, which means you're not being an asshole to the planet. <laughs> Great, right? Just yeah. stop taking yeah. the stuff. Stop onboarding yeah. every every chance you get. Protect your children, protect yourself from all the plastics mm -hmm. at all costs. Now, what do I do about the plastic that's already in my cells? Great. Sweat. Dance party time. Booyah. Hey, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I've got two teeny boppers in the house, 13 and a 10 year old, and you know, they they love to dance. So it's like in my four-year-old, she loves to dance too. I think we all love to dance. Sure. So, you know. If we remember how. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Just get out there and move and really get that going on. Some people are, you know, I have a bunch of clients that are incredibly heavy and they can't move as much. They have joint pain. They have chronic fatigue. So what I encourage them to do is do hot baths. So we do an Epsom salt bath, mm -hmm. magnesium sulfate. The magnesium and the sulfur help with detoxification. Actually, mm -hmm. sulfation is part of the way you get plastics out of the body. So two cups, 50 gallon tub. If you have sensitive skin, quarter cup of baking um, soda in there as well. Mm -hmm. That softens the skin up really nice. If you have a hard time sweating, which some people do when they're not uh, doing very well with mineral supply and, and certain amino acids, then I'll encourage them to drink a cup of ginger tea before they take a bath. Mm. And the ginger tea actually accelerates. Yeah, and this is actually data. There are two research studies on phthalates and BPA being excreted through the sweat put out mm -hmm. by Stephen Jenis up in Alberta. So that was really nice to, to know that you can sweat things out. That's great. The other thing is, interestingly enough, the enzymes that process BPA and phthalates, the, what's called uh, glucuronosyl transferases, these are incredibly ramped up by the consumption of broccoli. So you got broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, Brussels sprouts. If you can get some broccoli sprouts, there's 10 times the level of the sulforaphane that activates this in there. So, you know, eat some broccoli and, and some, a, lot of, a lot of cruciferous vegetables. So a couple servings a day would be ideal for a while if you're totally toxic. At least five servings per week seems to be the best. Don't worry about the thyroid function. You know, the weird thing is everybody says, man, if you eat cruciferous vegetables, it's going to kill my thyroid. I've talked to Johanna Lampia at UW Medical Center. I've talked to uh, Jed Fahey at Johns Hopkins. These people have dedicated their entire life to broccoli research. And they say, oh, come on, man. If you're not eating more than two pounds of raw cruciferous vegetables a day, you're iodine insufficient, have thyroid problems to begin with, it's just not, it's not an issue. So relax on that, mm. you know. Lightly steamed, a little bit of raw, you know, eat it up. Go for it. Stuff's great, right? Get that sweat going on and you'll see that, boom, things go really nicely. And you feel better, the weight starts coming off, you start feeling more clear and you have less chemical uh, threshold exposure. Um, uh, variants, right? So basically, if I walk into a room that would normally set me off, I should start feeling better and better, and, and I won't be close to like snap point. Mm. 
although I don't want to be ingesting more of that, like how do you how do you get someone who's already kind of at that place and like is on the cliff back down and to have them remember Slowly. to not go back and take that, right? Slowly. So I've had numerous cases like this. People are just falling apart. You know, they're wired and tired, but they're on disability because they can't even move. They're so tired, right? But they're anxious all the time. Their heart's palpating all the time. All these things are indication of, of chemical toxicity, right? Mm. You, you lower the exposure first. So air purifier in the house, drinking purified water, eating organic foods first. Mm -hmm. Then you start working on you know, sweating. Then you start working on increasing the sulfur-based vegetables. And you're usually working with a functional medicine practitioner. So you know, being a certified functional medicine practitioner means something. Mm -hmm. I took seven years of my life to learn about functional medicine, detoxification pathways, hormone pathways. You know, very few people are certified functional medicine practitioners. A lot of people are touting themselves as functional medicine experts. They do not have the training. Mm -hmm. So once you understand all these different pathways, you're gonna look at certain things that underlie detoxification and energy formation, like certain B vitamins, for example, certain minerals, certain amino acids that are necessary. So we'll take that all into consideration. You know, either someone's running extensive panels or they're doing an extensive intake form, and we'll look at where the weak spots might be and we'll, we'll recommend certain foods, certain herbs, certain supplements to boost that person's process. But you start out slowly. You do simple stuff, man. You reduce the exposure and you increase the things that help excrete. It's a simple ratio, mm. really. But then make that your standard practice and don't think that that's one week of your life that becomes kind of your culture because guess what? The oceans are getting more plastic in them today as we're speaking. Yeah. If things take decades to happen in your body, or decades, or, or you know, almost a century now to happen in nature, you can't ex expect to change them overnight. Right. But every single thing you do makes a difference. Mm -hmm. It made a difference in getting us where we're at. It'll make us have a, an accelerated path towards getting us out of this. Every single thing, whether it's using you know, recycled paper, unbleached toilet paper, whether it's eating one meal organic that you don't normally eat organic, every single thing has an impact. There is no away, it's all right here. So whatever you do, and, and the, the cool thing though is what it does to you as a human. Mm. When you're conscious of the difference you're making, you're standing up taller, yep. you're feeling better about yourself, you're feeling better about the planet, you feel more connected to people, life's better, man. You had done a video on broccoli sprouts. Yeah, a TED Talk, yeah. A TED Talk. Yeah. Do you have a resource you could share with our listeners and viewers on that? Oh, it's like super how to easy. Do it? Yeah. yeah, all you have to do is type in my name, Tom Malter, M A L T E R R E, yeah. into Google search window, plus TEDx, T E D X, and then boom, my broccoli video pops up. Great, great, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, man. man, thank you. <laughs> thank you for doing the stuff that you do. You're, uh, you're out there to. fighting the fight. Yeah, I, well, yeah, and so do I, and so do you, right? <laughs> Every single person who's listening or watching to this has a responsibility to their family, to themselves, their family, and their planet, right? Yeah. To step up and do something and understand that this stuff is smothering us. Yeah, It's gross, but uh, look, I didn't have to buy it at the store today. Why did I? Right, and so making conscious choices and demanding that of the stores that we shop in, and say, look, um, you know, I I would like to have glass bottles. Where are they? Yeah. Right. So the cool thing is, is you know, you made an, an awesome request to me where you said, you know, hey Tom, the Origins movie was really moving for a lot of people. Can we make this more practical? Can we make this more real? So you know, I've been putting all this information into an Origins lifestyle program. So we're going to have this stuff available for people, and there's going to be actual action items. So you'll follow me through the grocery store. I will show you what I do to reduce my plastics use, you know, whatnot. And we have to make this real for people. Yeah. And I think once we do, then they'll see it's not that difficult. Yeah. It's not. Well, you know what's more difficult? Is walking around with a bunch of plastic in your cells, wondering why you have no energy to sit, call mom and say hi. Okay, man. Let's, uh, just one second, okay? <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. One second. And that is, there's this incredible book called Terminus Brain that mm. basically ponders the fact that we think we're so intelligent. We're designing all these things to make our life so much more wonderful, all this technology and everything, right? But in the process, we're forming these chemical substances that are coming right back and interfering with our brain function. The brain mitochondria is actually one of the most sensitive tissues in the human body. Your neurons are extremely sensitive to chemical signaling, right? So now all of a sudden, we can't even ponder what we're doing. 
Mm. We forgot what we were doing in the beginning, which was being completely connected with all of life. We got really in intelligent, right? It's like taking that apple off that tree and taking that bite of knowledge and then saying, all of a sudden, we've lost it. We're like, why did we start this thing in the first place, right? Didn't we want to be more connected? You know, maybe mm. moving forward has allowed us to take a step back. Maybe we need to take a step back in order to move forward. Yeah, amen to that. Yeah, yeah I mean, not all progress is progressive, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah. well, but we're in this kind of adolescence phase of our species saying, well, just because we could yeah. doesn't mean we should. Sure. And there's nothing inherently wrong with technology, but how do we apply it to make life better mm -hmm. and not suffocate and kill ourselves? So, mm -hmm. I love it, man. I love your body of work. I love everything you're doing. Uh, the Origins Lifestyle Program is coming uh, very soon. And um, tell people where they can find you. Yeah, I'm at uh, wholelifenutrition.net, www.wholelifenutrition.net. Uh, that's probably the easiest way. You can also just Google my name, Tom Malter, M-A-L-T-E-R-R-E. You'll see lots of videos and stuff at the Autism Research Institute and stuff on podcasts. And so I'm out there. It's a busy dude. Yeah, man. Great to have you. Ah, pleasure to be here, buddy. Like I said, the guy is smart. Uh, Tom Altair is a hero, I love him. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. Give me comments in the thread. Also, go to theurbanmonk.com where we're putting up a ton of free resources. Uh, things are just coming together for the book launch, but I'm gonna have videos, meditations, all sorts of good stuff for you at theurbanmonk.com. I'll see you in the next show. Mm -hmm.